We are live. We're live. Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to the SoJess Sustainability Happy Hour. My name is Micah Bennett, and I am your co-host today. I am the communication specialist at the School of Global Environmental Sustainability at Colorado State University, and this is my co-host. Hi, my name is Pat. I am the lead scientist at the School of Global Environmental Sustainability, so just, and um, yeah, happy Friday. It's the end of the week. Um, and it's spring and the snow has stopped is it? in Fort Collins. I mean, it's, it's stopped for now. It's mostly melted. It's mostly melted, that's true, that's true. I'm just waiting for like the next foot dump, right? Like we always get, uh, like end of April, early May, we always get like a big snowstorm. Do we? And then it's like, yeah, like I always feel like May 5th, it's always like, where did this come? It's like 80 degrees, you're in a tank top and shorts <laughs> outside. Well, I am. And then the next day, it's like a foot of snow. And you're like, where is this coming from? Yeah. Positive yeah, vibes. Anyway. Right? Positive vibes. Positive um, vibes. Sorry. Positive vibes. It's going to be sunny. We're going to be like rollerblading out there with like, oh, the, yeah. Oh, thing yeah. with the, the big antenna. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. What? You got but, a fanny pack. You wear that. You wear the radio with the. It only. It's, it's only a radio, so it's like FM, like station playing '80s music with a big antenna. And then you got your rollerblades on or skates. I can't do either. This is what I envision doing on a sunny day, and I can't yeah. do any of those things. Yeah. Okay. So wait a second. Fun a fact time. Well, we have a great show for everyone today. Oh um, yeah. Right. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm going to put this in the chat. If you are watching on YouTube and Facebook, uh, talk to us. This is a live show. It's a live stream. We want to hear from you. Um, we want to hear your Absolutely. comments, your questions, your jokes. Um, so pop that in the chat and we'll try to answer them live during the show. Um, and you'll also be able to ask our special guest questions directly if you are curious. Pat, do you want to give our audience an idea of who we're going to bring on today? Yes, today we are going to have an esteemed guest, Dr. Rekha Warrior. Uh, she is uh, currently a postdoc, actually, at Soja. Spoiler alert, she's working on a project that I'm also working on. Uh, so I know Rekha as a colleague doing research, uh, but she's also done so many other cool things. So we're going to talk about more than just the research that she's doing right now. She's done research on uh, looking at kind of human um, and uh, animal interactions on tigers in India. Um, she's uh, done a lot of work around uh, kind of climate change activism and writing around that. So we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different things today. Uh, I think it's going to be a great conversation. Yeah. And so on that note, though, um, since Reka studies tigers, I think somebody has a tiger fun fact, right? Oh, I sure do. I sure oh. do, Pat. Um, did you know, Pat, that tigers are the only cat species that are completely striped? and that they even have stripes on their skin. Wow, really? Yeah. Like if you shave a tiger, it's gonna be striped. I think so. Well, I mean, we'll have to confirm that with- Okay, I, on. I nominate you, not me, to shave the tiger because that sounds scary. <laughs> did you watch um, Did you watch Tiger King last summer? No, I wasn't. I, I, I was sort of like, I don't think I like this idea. It's No, it's, it's really pretty bad in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> It's like very entertaining, um, yeah. but very sensational and um, like pretty misogynistic. Yeah. But 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 it is. It was. I, I watched it mainly because I wanted to partake in that cultural moment. You know, it seemed yeah, like everyone fair. was talking about Tiger King. Um, and I did learn some things about tigers during that show. So, but that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> we will we're not, not talking be about King. talking that's about. That's okay. Um, okay. Fun fact. So. I'm not sure how fun this is, but did you know that tigers and lions can actually create a liger? Mm, I knew so that because of another cult, that. because of another cultural touchstone. But I didn't know. So okay, I know this was a Napoleon Dynamite, right? <laughs> that, Ligers, but it. I thought that was a joke. Like I just thought that was like, oh, that's a funny idea, right? Mm, but like, it's real. A, but it's real. I, I I don't have a picture ready to go, so like you'll have to believe me. You'll have to look it up. I assume that if you type in liger. It'll probably just be a whole bunch of Napoleon Dynamite stuff, um, but it's a thing, right? And maybe, maybe, maybe Rekha can also like give us some 
some better tiger facts than like right. shaving tigers and ligers, <laughs> but I feel well, like that's both, a good. Shaving tigers and liger, ligers both have, I feel like maybe some ethical concerns there that. that yeah, that's true. That's maybe true. Maybe we, yeah. Anyways. That sounds like, like a, I don't know what kind of band that is, but it sounds like a band name. Mm, shaving tigers? I don't know. Is that something? Like Smashing Pumpkins, Shaving Tigers? Like Smashing Pumpkins, yeah, exactly. I was just thinking of Smashing Pumpkins the other day. Weird. Okay, on to more important things. Um, like the news. Like the news. And actually, there's been a lot of actually really good news. I, all, I feel like Earth Day sometimes is just like kind of a bummer because it makes you like reflect mm. on how bad things are. But this year wasn't that way. So we have a news article. Let's see if I can correctly pull this up. Tell me more. Right. So this is um, this is from the, the Biden administration. Uh, Biden's intelligence director vows to put climate at the center of foreign policy. There's so much about this sentence that is just very nice to read. Um, yes. It is you know, nice like it's, I'm, st I'm, I'm, I'm very happy <laughs> that reading the news is a positive experience. And in this um, particular and, case. And commentary. But this week in particular, this is a pretty big deal. So um, this article, which we'll post in the show notes, kind of details some really, honestly, kind of shocking statements in a good way about how this, uh, the new intelligence director is going to really put climate change and climate adaptation and um, preparedness at the center of how the, um, at least the intelligence community in the United States government is thinking about climate change. Um, and so one, um, so there's a ton of different details about how this kind of slots into different aspects of say um, NATO. So that's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization's preparedness and their planning. Uh, but there's also kind of a really nerdy part here where it says the CIA announced it was adding a new category covering the environment to its world fact book. Um, the agency's unclassified guide will now provide the latest country data on climate, air pollutants, infectious diseases, food security, waste, and other environmental topics. So to me though, this is actually very cool because this is a really important resource for a lot of people for um, finding quick available information about different countries around the world. Um, I mean, I remember, I don't know, in high school, like we would use the CIA World Factbook if you're like trying to do like a report or something. That's one of the first places you go because there's this really efficient, quick summary of information. What's what's the what are the economies like, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this is actually just like kind of like the I don't know the high school report writer in me is like, whoa, new data on the environment in the CIA World Factbook. Um, and yeah, so anyway, that is exciting. Um, and then this also comes sort of on the tails. I don't think this is covered very much in here um, in this particular article. But the, the US has a new climate goal, and I, um, I'm not gonna dig into this too much, but if you're interested, you should read up on this because it's a very substantial target for the US to make. Um, yeah, they do, they do mention it um, towards the very end of the first article you shared about how um, the, they aim to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 50% from 2005 levels. Right. And, um, and this is very substantial in some ways. Um, and then you can see how it changes um, depending on what benchmark you're using. So like right here, we see versus 2005 versus 1990, because there's different ways to sort of calculate how much you would reduce by and what that actually means. Mm. Um, but regardless, to make such a kind of bold, significant goal, is important now it doesn't mean that we'll hit it you know we'll see what happens over the next decade mm -hmm. but to actually sort of draw a line in the sand and say hey we're going to go for this it is a pretty big deal it also signals to all sorts of other aspects of our society the economy industries whatever saying hey we as a government are making this goal and we're going to probably put some policies behind this and you should join the boat because we're going to try be changing <laughs> the way our economy works if we try and actually do this mm -hmm. anyway it's just a lot of excitement this week in, in terms of really pushing climate change, the urgency around doing something around climate change so much further up the agenda than it's been for, honestly, what feels like as long as it's been an issue. Yeah, we'll put, the anyway, links, we'll put these links in the post show notes if you are interested yes. in reading the articles fully. 
Um, but yeah, should we should we move along to the meat of our of our show yes, here? Yes, that's right. Rick, are you good to go? Thumbs up. Thumbs up. All right, we're gonna bring you on. I'm gonna turn this off. Boom. I'm gonna put you up there. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> good afternoon. Welcome to the show. Happy Friday. I'm excited to be here. I love the show. That's great. Um, okay, so I tried to give like a, a ham-fisted introdu introduction for you today. Do you mind just saying who you are? Uh, you have actually sort of a longer history than some of our guests with Sojus, so maybe just share a little bit about that, um, and then we'll we'll just start start talking. Yeah. Uh, so hi, uh, my name is Rika, uh, and. <laughs> Uh, I'm a, a postdoctoral fellow working with Pat at the School of Global Environmental Sustainability, and uh, I started there in 2000, uh, towards the end of 2019. Um, and uh, prior to that, I was a so just sustainability leadership fellow. Um, this was when I was doing my doctoral research in the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology. Um, so that's that's kind of my engagement with so just so far um yeah that's you know it's kind of funny you said that you started with so just um in around 2019 and to me i'm like oh like yeah like last year but i'm like no you've been here you've been around for a lot longer than just one year and then i remember that 2019 was not last year <laughs> 2020 is the last year it's kind of um, it is it is yeah well, thank you so much for joining us yeah. today. We're really excited Absolutely. to talk to you, you about having... your work. Um, my first very important question for for you is, can you confirm, do tigers have stripes on their skins? Yes, they do. Hard -hitting questions on the sustainability <laughs> It's almost like they're tattooed with those stripes. They're like tattooed, which yeah. I guess makes sense because like that's where the hair follicles come from. So, although, you know, those... like my head is not this color. Well, that doesn't make sense, actually. <laughs> um, you know, who wants that job, though? Like, going around and just being like, can you hold still? I just have a little bit more on the strike to do. <laughs> is that, this is not, that's not how it works, right? Like, somebody's not going around and, no, okay. Yeah, so the, and the stripes are, you know, they're unique to each individual and they're different on each side. So um, a lot of a lot of the work that goes into estimating tiger numbers really leverages that fact because you can individually identify individuals. So oh, that's very cool. They're yeah. like little snowflakes, little yes. fingerprints. Yeah, they are. <laughs> they're pretty little unique. Tiger stripe fingerprints. Yeah, um, they're exactly like fingerprints. So um, do people in the field who are doing work with tigers then like they can be like, oh, there's Hank, there's, you know, there's Marie. Like in yeah. terms of they come up with names to name the tigers because yeah. they can recognize them so well because of the stripes. Is that a thing? Yeah. So uh when when we were uh doing work in um in some of these national parks in northern India, uh, the tiger populations there were pretty small. Uh so there's you know some parts that have about 10 or 12 individuals. And it's pretty easy to, you know, you see enough pictures, camera trap pictures, uh, uh, that over time you just know who's who. And most of them, we give them names, um, depending on where their territories are, you know, in what area of the park. So they all have names. And so you can say, oh, that's Beam and that's Jadu. And <laughs> nice. You know, and since we're on this vein of tigers, can you give us um, a, like an overview of what your work was in that project or is, is it still, go is it still happening? Uh, no, so I, I worked with WWF India uh, as a field biologist uh, on a project that was estimating uh, tiger distributions and abundance uh, in what's called the Terai Art landscape. So it's this large uh, landscape that's com composed of uh, grasslands and uh, forests that are right on the border with Nepal. So it's a region that's right on the border with Nepal. And it's a fairly unique ecosystem. It's quite threatened. Um, it's composed of these tall grassland patches where these grasses grow, you know, they grow really tall. So they're like 10, 12 feet high in some places. Oh. It easily hides an elephant. Um, grasses? Yeah, it's 
Wow. Real geography. You can you can walk through it and not see an elephant approach you. It's it's oh that. Gosh. That sounds terrifying. Yeah, it, it is <laughs> pretty scary. Uh, and so it's a very sort of um, it's a pretty unique system. You know, in the past it would have supported um, pretty big populations of Asian elephants, rhinoceros, um, quite high densities of tigers. Um, but over time, you know, those places have gotten fragmented. Uh, so now they're just in within protected areas. Everything outside is converted to agriculture. Uh, so for a, a, before I started my PhD, I worked on this project that was held by a former lab mate uh, who also got his uh, degree from uh, Fish and Wildlife working with Barry Noon, Prana. So we were estimating tiger numbers and how they're distributed across that landscape. And then my project um, sort of built off on that and asked, oh, well, how are they using these areas outside of protected areas that are largely dominated by sugarcane agriculture? And uh, some of it was uh, spurred by observations that you know tigers are moving in these agricultural areas because the sugarcane farmlands look like these tall grasslands. They're you know oh. dense extensive tall and not as um, heavily sort of populated like the settlements there's lots of people there it's a densely populated part of the country but the sugarcane farmlands are extensive there's not a lot of people moving through it all the time so it was a question about understanding how do they serve as habitats are they used all all the time throughout the year or are they seasonally used and how are other species using these farmlands like the different deer species that occur there so that was that was broadly the some of the questions that were addressed. Gotcha. So we we have a question from last episode's guest, uh, Rob Shore. Have AI algorithms been developed to identify the variety of tiger striping for individual ID of tigers? I any, think uh, that, any thoughts? Yeah, I think there are some softwares out there that uh, sort of leverage AI to um, distinguish between different tigers, so based on their stripes. Uh, there's some right. aut automated identification software now. Um, we right. never used them. We primarily did them by eye. So we just right. compare pictures. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if there's only, at least in a study site, if there's, you know, less than 20 individuals and you start to just know, then you just know. In some yeah. Ways, I suppose. Yeah. Um, we will have, you know, three or four uh, sets of independent observers go through mm -hmm. all the pictures and, you know, uh, confirm how many individuals there are just to make sure that there isn't any double counting or missing uh, unique new individuals. But yeah, when you have small populations, it's fairly easy to do that. It's much harder when there's 100 tigers. Okay, so I have a question. So you, you were doing tiger research before you did your PhD. Yes. So what did you do before tiger research? Like, how does one get into tiger research? You know, like, let's um, say, let's say we've got some viewers today that are like, you know, I'm just daily living my life and I want to start studying tigers. Like, what did you do? It's a, it's a bit of a cliche in India to be a wildlife biologist and studying tigers. It's like, is it really in India? It's a cliche. Yeah, there's just a lot of people uh, doing that. <laughs> it kind of gets a little exoticized when you leave the country. It's like, oh, you're studying tigers, but you know nobody pays you any attention in India. Uh, but I was I was looking for something to do and. Uh, my my friend Pranav had just started his PhD fieldwork, needed a field biologist, and uh, you know uh, I I was excited to pretty much um, see a new place and learn some new skills. So that's that's kind of how I wound up. Just so you know, good contacts and just a curiosity for uh, checking out. I mean, it's it's not like. I'm just imagining you're like, I was looking for something to do, you know, I was like, you know, my friend got a job at the Gap and I was, you know, I, I thought I was just like, I mean, it's not like that, is it? Well, no, no, well, okay. okay, so what's the origin story of the origin story? Um, so I was, uh, I was, I did my master's in wildlife biology and so that's okay. how, uh, in India, and uh, for my master's dissertation, I studied uh, hornbills. Um, oh, okay. it, it used some of the same skills that I, uh, you know, and some of the same techniques that I ended up using for um, my research on tigers. 
Um, so that's, that's kind of how I uh, got to know a lot of the people in the field. And so that's how you sort of network and learn about ongoing projects. And it was soon after my master's that um, I was looking for something to do. And this came along. And that's how I ended up meeting my uh, PhD advisor, too, and you know, sort of, sort of following up on the, on the project. Wow, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so it's not as simple as looking for a job. Um, but it's still, it's surprisingly kind of shocking to me that it's not that exciting to be a tiger biologist. Um, OK, so. Kind of a so, wild group in India somehow because we get so much of, of the funding. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, well, and, and there are a lot more tigers in India than there is in, for example, the United States. <laughs> right? No, that's not, that would have been a fun fact. There are actually more tigers in the US than there Whoa. are in India. Are you serious? Really? I'm serious, yeah. And like, Wait, like because of zoos and what? refuges? Like, and uh, you know, um, I think private collections, people have them as pets and all, all of those things together, there are about- like how, many t how many privately collected tigers are there? Ben? Oh, there's a I lot, mean, like, Pat. You didn't watch Tiger King. I didn't watch Tiger King, you're right. Right, did, break it, did, you, did you watch Tiger King? I did not, I couldn't get myself to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, but that, I guess that does actually kind of make sense because yes, there are a lot of like, yeah, private, that's, yeah, yeah wow, interesting. Well, then how many Dan tigers Preston. are there? Sorry. Sorry. I was going to, I was just going to ask how many tigers do you know, like kind of a rough sense of like how many tigers are actually in, alive in India in the wild? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, based on more recent estimates, there's probably between 3000 and 3500 tigers globally, um, you know, including all the, all the four or six subspecies and of which Close to 2,800 or 3,000 are in India. So the sizable okay. population of tigers is uh, is within India. Okay. Yeah. So not that many. It's actually. Uh, oh, it's not that many at all. Yeah, it's as many people as in uh, as there are in this town that I'm living in. So hmm. in Aho, Arizona. Yeah, three, about wow. 3,000. Yeah. That's that's. I mean, that's kind of depressing though because I feel like. That's a very small number. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, um, well, then I guess maybe um, before we pivot to the next topic, I mean, in your experience, because you studied tigers for so long before you did, or for a while before you did your PhD, then you did your PhD and you were thinking about tigers a lot. I mean, if you had to provide just like a quick, what do you think about tiger, like the future of tiger conservation um, in in the sense of, uh, where are where's the species going? Um, maybe even in the context of of just all of the pressures, climate change, anthropogenic pressure, just more people being around them. Like, what's your sense of where things are going for tigers? Um, so so far, the biggest threat to the species, you know, what's brought it to its brink, uh, has been poaching. Uh, a lot of illegal okay. harvest of the species, and that remains the biggest threat. Um, but that's so far, but obviously we're sort of seeing, you know, accelerated climate change, this uh, accelerated habitat loss. So the compounded effects of all that, um, it's not clear if that, you know, at some point out, outweigh the impacts of poaching even. Um, but what's true of tigers um, is that, you know, at, this is a species that is extremely versatile in its uh, ability to uh, you know live in different kinds of habitats so it's found in the russian far east in these mm -hmm. extremely cold environments and all the way you know the northwestern limit is this um, arid scrub jungle there with mm -hmm. you know they survive so they are extremely uh, versatile in that respect and they're also extraordinarily efficient predators and you know they're a cat they they can sort of really hide in plain sight in many places so in a way they may be a little more uh, resilient than many other uh, you know species uh, that might be more threatened by some of these 
global changes. But uh, poaching remains the most significant threat. Any any population viability analyses that have been done for the species say that uh, so long as there is poaching, the species can't really uh, thrive anywhere. Mm. Well, I do want to, as much as I could probably talk about tigers for the entirety of this show, um, I do want to ask you about some of your other work. Yeah. Um, so what what's the project that you're currently working on? Okay, so uh, that is a lot more, it's, it's a lot more complex to explain than uh, we're trying to estimate the number of tigers in a, in a forest. So, it, we were uh, just talking about the last show too, um, we talked a lot about bats. We were saying how sometimes it is fun just to like talk about these charismatic animals. You know, yeah. it's, it makes for good entertainment. Um, <laughs> yeah. But but this is a science show, maybe. So yeah. let's talk about yeah this. <laughs> and, and really quickly before before we dive into that, just if you're chiming in now, this is the Soja Sustainability Happy Hour, and uh, today we are talking with Dr. Rick, a warrior. Uh, who has done research on uh, tiger conservation, who's been uh, working on what we're probably gonna hear about here in a second, which is some agent-based modeling. And she's also pretty active in thinking about climate change and uh, climate change activism. And so um, thank you for joining us. If you have questions, plug it in on whatever platform you're using. Um, YouTube or Facebook. Okay, Incl what's that? YouTube or Facebook. It doesn't work on YouTube Twitter, Facebook. unfortunately. Um, or if you know, like you need to drive drive by my house, just like knock on the window and just put up a you know, sign. A question, hold up a sign. Um, okay, take it away, Rika. What are you working yeah, on? Now? So, <laughs> okay, I try and um, uh, summarize this in a few sentences. So we're building an even based model with a lot of help from Pat and Randy Boone and Kathy Galvin uh, that basically tries to understand um, the interactions between communities in Kenya who are dependent on the land for their livelihood. So we're talking about farmers, pastoralists, and how they interact with their environment and how the environment in turn you know, shapes their lives and uh, their ability to meet their food and economic needs. So, and the broader goal is to try and understand how different policy directions would you know, uh, affect the achievement of sustainable development goals that uh, you know Kenya has committed to. Um, so, for example, one of the uh, one of the objectives in the project is to understand if you were to, you know, in, under different scenarios of forest cover for Kenya, uh, what are the possible outcomes in terms of you know its its impacts on food security in different parts of uh, Kenya. You know, just through the impacts of forests on rainfall um, across the region and then subsequent impacts on the availability of pastures for livestock and thereby the livelihoods of pastoral people. So it's a fairly complex uh, model. Uh, it, it's sort of developed as an agent-based model, which is to say that you're trying to simulate a system from, from first principles. So it's a household, there's people in the household, they have their livestock herds, they need uh, some amount of fodder uh, to survive. And depending upon the availability of the fodder that's simulated by another model, uh, we can determine you know, the, the fates of those uh, individual heads of livestock and thereby try and understand how the household itself fares over a period of time. So that's that's kind of the work. And so and and um, and so with this where you're trying to get like capture sort of how people like how the system is responding to these changes, right? So like if if it's a rainier year, then maybe there's um, like more grass or other stuff that the, the livestock eats in that year. So so then how how would that change what the people do in your model? So like if, if it's uh, like, do the people do things differently depending on whether or not different livestock are doing well or worse? Yeah, so, um, so this is, uh, you know, prior to starting this project, I, I knew so little about pastoral communities in Kenya, like the Maasai. I just knew they were extremely interesting and cool, but I didn't know that such a sizable portion of their diet is composed of livestock products, like primarily dairy, not even meat. Um, 
And so a good portion of their uh, dietary needs are met by their livestock. And the livestock also forms the um, their main source of wealth and their uh, main source of savings. So it's, it's not an economy that's, you know, uh, linked to banks or, you know, there isn't a lot of uh, money that's involved here. It's primarily wealth. Uh, that's accumulated in the form of livestock herds. So wow. cattle, camel, sheep, and goat. So their fortune- it's like, mobile, it's like a mobile bank account that you sort of carry mm -hmm. around or it walks yeah. around with you. Yeah, and uh, oh, okay. and um, yeah, so the fortune of each household is quite um, intricately tied to the fortunes of those livestock herds. So you know how well they do in any given year, um, which again, in these arid and semi-arid lands is, sort of disproportionately affected by how much it rains. So a drought can have a really uh, significant impact on livestock herds and thereby really affect food security across this region. And um, this, is, this is a part of the world where food security is an issue. There are uh, periods of chronic um, uh, sort of hunger um, that is observed here. So it, yeah, that's kind of how these questions gain relevance. Hmm. I have a question. Um, we, we've talked about m models before on this show, and I've worked with Pat on a couple of projects for SoJest based on modeling. Um, but as it's funny, I'm a fairly visual person, but sometimes I still struggle with grasping, like what what does your product look like when you when your end product of this model, what does that look like? Is it like is it like The Sims? Do you have do you now have a Sims of of pastoral Kenya, and you've got little avatars that do things? Uh, I assume that no. is great. That would be very cool. But so, what does the product look like of your model? Um, yeah. So the agent based model that we've built it's on a platform called Net Logo. And for anybody who's interested, it's a freely downloadable software. There's a lot of like canned models that are available in there that you can explore. But it is uh, it the interface looks a little bit like playing a video game because there are these agents. You can get them to do things. They move around. Uh, they can interact with each other. So it is like um, what's the um, uh, Pac-Man? So you know how you have Pac-Man. You have these little. Uh, sort of uh, entities and they're moving around. So it's kind of, you can uh, get agents to sort of move on this landscape and interact with elements of the landscape. Uh, so in, in our case, the agents are households. Um, they move uh, when the, you know, patch that they're located on when the pasture runs out or there are better pastures elsewhere for their livestock. So they're uh, sort of programmed to uh, move and sort of respond to some of these diverse imperatives. And uh, the pro outcomes, some of the you know useful outcomes that we uh, try and summarize from these models is over the span of say 10 or 20 years after you know experiencing periods of good rainfall and drought, what happens to um, the total you know wealth that a household has so how does a if a poor say a household that's poor does it stay poor through this period um, do they accumulate wealth over this period of time uh, what are the periods during which uh, certain regions of kenya experience um, exacerbated food insecurities so uh, the outcome, there are a lot of different things that can be summarized, but some of the key things we are interested in is the spatial dif uh, distribution of um, food insecurity. Are there certain regions of Kenya that no matter what are uh, just purely because of their geography are you know, likely to be impacted quite severely by droughts and will experience uh, enhanced food stress? So that's, that's some of the outcomes, but um, Tracking, so uh, I think I obsessively monitor how cattle, sheep, and goat populations are doing. Sometimes they crash. It's quite um, stressful to see that happen because you know something devastating is happening deep inside the model that needs to be fixed. But typically, you're monitoring a number of uh, parameters that are related to livestock herds and uh, specifically to um, the households uh, in terms of food security. Yeah. And also economic transactions. So households, when they when they are sort of short of money, will sell cattle. When they have a surplus of income, they'll buy livestock. 
they also gift livestock to each other. So that's a big part of the social interactions in these communities is um, wealthier households gifting li uh, livestock or milk to uh, poorer uh, family members or those who are in need in their surrounding areas. Yeah. That's like a perfect segue to this question we just got, which is how do you incorporate cooperative versus competitive behavior on the parts of the agents or the households? Is there a game theoretic component of your model uh, based on that? Um, wow, that's a great uh, question. There isn't, uh, I wouldn't say there is any explicit uh, cooperative behavior incorporated into it. There is competition. So for example, it's these are all density dependent responses. So, you know, the more uh, number of people there are on a patch, the less there is for each individual head of livestock to, you know, access. So uh, that density dependent um, effect is sort of um, in the model. Um, the I don't think there are any cooperative behaviors uh, in there other than this idea of gifting. So wealthier households will gift uh, to poorer households. And oh, also the idea that then, so um, there is a lot of conflict, inter-ethnic inter group conflicts. So when, um, when households sort of transgress some boundaries, so either a national boundary, so they move into Uganda or Tanzania, or they move across county boundaries and get into the lands of another ethnic group, um, there is potential for conflict. So, you know, and this is typically manifested through the loss of livestock because of raiding. So um, that's sort of how, that is in a way, one kind of competition. So that's, those are the couple of different ways it's uh, incorporated. Hmm. Great. Yeah. Well, um, I feel a little bit, I feel a little bit like I'm, I shouldn't ask the questions. Um, because we just talked earlier today about this project. Um, no, I'd be happy to talk more. Um, but no, well, I, what I want to make sure we cover though is the fact that um, so this is like this is like your science hat, your job hat, right? Like in a way, like these are all things that you've done, you know, for work. But then you're also very you're an engaged person when it comes to the environment and thinking about the environment, how we should be living on the environment. Um, and so, for example, I just wanted to pull up this. You wrote this blog piece pretty recently, right? Um, yeah, last year. Last year last yeah, last year. summer. And it's uh, it's called a brief history of three desert survivors. Maybe you could just speak very briefly about this because this is like totally separate from what you do for work. Uh, yeah, and this I would say uh, it's inspired by work in some ways because um, I think it. Um, I think this project especially uh, has um, lent me some skills at thinking about complexity, about a prop, you know, uh, because I think uh, in my postdoc, in my doctoral work, uh, with, with conservation issues, I think there's a tendency to very narrowly define a problem. So, you know, what is the fraction of a landscape that's occupied by tigers? What are the number of animals that are in this um, in this forest? So they're very narrowly defined problems. The approaches to answering those problems are also uh, involve, you know, sp specific kinds of, I think, skills and uh, specific kinds of data. Uh, but I think the larger question of, uh, given what we know about the state of the environment, uh, how do we get to a place where, uh, you know, we can actually you know, change the uh, trajectory or the you know destinies of these species. Given everything that we know, how do we get them to a place where we can um, say the tiger populations are secured or any of those questions? I think those are far more complex things to answer, and it's it's uh, it's very hard to do that without, I think taking the full sweep of history and, uh, you know, the, the geographical context in which these uh, issues are playing out. So um, this is, I think, a, a, it's an interesting way to think about a conservation issue because, you know, I'm, I'm living here in the, in the Sonoran Desert um, and um, this is a little spring uh, uh, and a reservoir called the Quito Bukito, um, um 
at the Quito Poquito uh, area. And here there's a, it's, it's a pond that has three, um, three species, a turtle, uh, a fish, and a snail, all of which are um, endangered. The, and it's, it's interesting that um, last summer, you know, obviously there was a, it's one of the hottest years on record, 2020, we know that now. Um, in the, at the height of summer, the water levels in that pond started uh, declining quite precipitously. And uh, it also coincided with the building of the border wall, uh, you know, that was coming up in that landscape. And it was speculated that uh, the declines in water levels may have something to do with, you know, tapping off those aquifers for construction activity. Um, so uh, I think the article was intended to sort of take a look at, you know, how did we get here? What is it that got us to this point? Uh, why is the why are all these fish now in this one location? Why is this the one spot where you know uh, their their fate is sort of uh, tied now to the condition of this one pool of water um, and that location of the wall there is not coincidental. It's tied to all of the things that led, led us to this point. Um, and so it was sort of interrogating, you know, how um, just uh, things like basic science, denial, racism, all of that, they do um, eventually sort of collide at this one point. And it's, it this seemed like a perfect example of all of those things. Uh, sort of happening all at once in this one system. So that was that was kind of the idea behind behind writing it. Yeah, I just um I just revisited this this post um in in preparation for this show and reread it. And we'll put this in the show notes too. And if you haven't read it, I would highly encourage it. Um the I found that the writing was like very poetic prose and Thanks. One thing I wanted to ask you about was part of my interpretation of it was that it talked a lot about time and sort of cycles, both cycles of the species and of the hu like you know the humans around it, and sort of repeating history. Um, and I felt like you were you made. Um, those three species were kind of a backdrop for some larger themes. And there's just the excerpt that I want to read. And it says, thus with the displacement of a little bit of earth, the three species quietly slipped into a century and a half of solitude. It goes on to say, for our planet that is billions of years old, 150 years, perhaps has the same import that a single second does in our lives today. But for us, the arc of history that connects 1860 and 2020 spans many distinct epochs. And then it goes on to talk about um, kind of what you said about climate denial and then activism and then denial in a new way. And I was just wondering if you could touch a little bit on sort of that like cyclical um, nature of things and what you were talking about how it all tied in to bring us to this point where these three species are in this pond. Um, yeah. Is that kind of what you were going for? Yeah, I think uh, the I, some of the ideas in there were just talking about, uh, you know, how we constantly uh, hear this trope about how things are so much better now. You know, we are in a better world. We have sort of solved so many problems and, uh, and all of, there might be a fragment of truth in some of those claims, but it is also true that we just reinvented new ways of doing terrible things. So, you know, it, there isn't any explicit colonialism perhaps, but we still have largely neo-colonial trade policies. And, uh, you know, there is, we don't have the world wars raging anymore, you know, like they did between, I don't know, 1910 and 1945, but, we do have wars raging in most parts of the world. And so there are all these, it's, it's just old things in a new bottle that are uh, just going on. And the, the denialism too has taken on new forms, uh, right? Like uh, we went from a point of denying uh, 
climate change to now saying, well, uh, the climate's always been changing. It's not anthropogenic. So there's just new ways of avoiding uh, responsibility and doing the right thing. So that was one, uh, one theme. But uh, the other one was also sort of talking about this, I think, uh, in sort of ending it the way it did, the idea there was to say, you know, um, so far we've we've succeeded very well in changing the climate. We've been able to dictate uh, how some of these things function, how you know how we're able to sort of um, gain from this sort of largely extraction-based economy. But now, now that we've set this, uh, unleashed this monster, so to speak. It is no longer up to us what is going to come. You know, some of these things are uh, fixed, unless, of, unless of course, there's large-scale carbon removal technology or whatever uh, that comes in the future. But we have changed uh, the atmosphere in significant ways and set some things in motion that are uh, no longer under our control. Now it's up to us to adapt to some of these changes. So this idea that you know just ended by saying that the pool may overflow and the wall may fall. You know, we can do all of these things. We can uh, really sort of build a wall, but whether that wall stands is entirely not up to us anymore. But you could have, uh, we could have an environment going forward into the future and could just, you know, collapse some of the systems that we put so much faith in. I guess um, we're getting close to the end of the show. But I would, I would love to, I would, I'm just curious how, almost like synthesizing all the things that we've talked about today, where uh, we started talking about like a specific species, right? Like in a specific conservation status, status of a specific species. Then you were speaking about your work now, um, simulating uh, agent behavior in Kenya, uh, people's behavior in Kenya and how they interact with the landscape and how that sort of unlocked some complexity thinking for you uh, or that at least has sort of initiated some of that in your mind. Um, and now in the context of thinking about this and the converse, in the context of these changes that we're setting in motion, some of which we can probably rein in, some of which we probably can't, you know, like maybe we can do things about certain landscapes. Well, we're not, if we set, if we wake up Greenland's ice sheet, for example, we're probably not gonna rein that in, at least on a time scale we care about. And so um, I guess from your perspective, as you're thinking about your role as a scientist and how you influence policy or not, or influence what we do, whatever that means, society, people, um, how do you see your role in that? I mean, as somebody now who has expertise in lots of different aspects of how are we have environmental impact or interactions, whatever phrase you want to use, like where do you see you now sitting at sort of this surprisingly important confluence of events, space and time, like the next 30 years for whatever reason, well, we know the reasons are actually gonna be highly consequential. So like, what yeah. do you wanna do? You, you seem like you could do lots of things. So how do you see your, yourself fitting into that? Um, gosh, this, this ends up being an anxiety inducing question because it's like- You can just talk about cats and tigers. I wanna talk about cats and tigers. <laughs> I'm just curious. Um, I, think, I think there are two ways to think about it. You know, just being scientists, you're exposed to so much uh, information about what the world uh, is like right now, uh, and very nuanced information, uh, and what the world uh, will be potentially like now, um, you know, in the future. So um, it, it comes with a lot of, I think, responsibility to help uh, communicate those uh, that you know those bits of knowledge so communicating it uh, amongst uh, friends family uh, all of that um, and also amongst people who have the power to make decisions so they need to know what you know uh, so that they they're more empathetic in the ways they formulate policy so there is I definitely see that that's an important uh, role and I sort of I take it somewhat seriously. I'd like to take it more seriously uh, uh, going forward, uh, either in a personal or a professional capacity. I'm not sure about that. But uh, but I think also in just the kinds of uh, work that 
you know we're trying to do with this project i think it's it's really exciting because um well, a big uh, i think a big challenge in doing the right thing making the right kind of policy is also being able to imagine a future that we want to be in and um and the kinds of futures that we want to avoid. So, you know, I always think of the IPCC scenarios of, you know, they clearly lay out a two degree warmer world is worse than a 1.5 degree warmer world. Let's not go there. So that's a very clear way of, you know, thinking about the future. And so um, trying to sort of forecast and sort of think about scenarios you know, what sort of world do we want to live in? How do we get there? What are the key factors that keep us from getting there? Um, trying to sort of do that sort of science and that ends up being very interdisciplinary. I, you know, I've just realized that I, I enjoy that sort of work, uh, you know, with my experience with this project. Uh, so hopefully more of that is what I'm hoping to do uh, as a scientist, but certainly communicating it and uh, finding ways to communicate it that are uh, enjoyable for the lay reader, that would be nice. Uh, yeah, but finding the time to do more of that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that too. yeah, I don't know where time goes. <laughs> Especially a whole year. Where did that year go? Last year. Um, that's right. Okay, so uh, we do have, why don't you ask this last question, Micah? Yeah, as we wrap things up, we've got a final question we like to ask our guests. Um, this is, can be personal, professional, somewhere in between. What is something that you are hopeful about right now? Um, right now? Um, right now. It could be, you know, like the pizza you're about to eat for Friday night, or it could be something, you know, more than that. Uh, um. Well, yeah, I think uh, I think with the pandemic and the way it last year unfolded, uh, you know, it's really sort of laid bare all of the ways in which things are not working in, you know, across, you know, in my country, in uh, my back in India, in uh, in the U.S. And I think. Um, it's really, and all of the other things also that happened last year, you know, the conversations that have been spurred on account of that, um, the ways people are starting to sort of really question existing um, systems. Um, I think it's sort of uh, ignited new conversations uh, that are really, that are really good. It's been a long time in the making and I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful that, you know, all of that doesn't lose its momentum as we sort of put this behind us and uh, sort of, you know, slip back into whatever new normal comes after this. Um, but I'm, I'm really hopeful that those conversations sort of really help us reimagine how the world should be and, you know, find find ways to work towards that future. So that's, that's I think, the one thing I'll take away from, from 2020. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful about this weekend. And I'm burning. The big right. things and the little things. You gotta appreciate both. Yeah. yeah. Little things. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks this for having awesome me. Awesome conversation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, well, we will bid you adieu and let you go enjoy and, your weekend. And yeah. okay. thank you again. All right. Okay. All right. We need to let our viewers get to their weekend as well. That's right. So we're yes. going to keep these announcements quick. A um, couple of plugs for Sojas. If you would like to get more information about this show, the Sustainability Happy Hour, you can sign up for email updates. Um, oh, what's that? Look at, at this. Have you not seen this page before? No, I'm you, just kidding. I was just trying to act surprised. It. I was just trying to act surprised. Yeah, I'm, you're right. I, I appreciate I appreciate your acting. Um, at sustainability.colostate.edu slash sustainability happy hour. Um, and then you can also sign up for our general mailing list, which means you'll get a lot more than just sustainability happy hour. Um, and you can also find that on the SoJust website. We do have um, a couple of great events coming up in the near term on next Thursday, uh, April 29th. We're going to have our final managing the planet panel discussion of the semester. 
It is going to be virtual and it is called Changing Times in Washington, D.C. Opportunities and Challenges for CSU. Um, we are going to be talking with CSU leaders about what all these changes in the Washington administration mean for CSU students, faculty, staff, and other community members. Um, we did have a slight panelist change, unfortunately. Um, the CSU president had a conflict come up, but we are very excited to have our uh, new panelist, Alan Rudolph. He is the vice president for research. Um, and we're gonna have the opportunity to hear from these CSU leaders. And there's also a Q&A portion of managing the planet. So that is on April 29th, five to 6 p.m. And then on Tuesday, the 27th, so this is um, a little earlier, it is the Antarctic Lecture Series with Dr. Andrew Fountain, um, and it is called Dynamic Antarctica, More Than Just a Slab of Ice. So if you are interested in that, you can find that on the Sojus website as well. And, and that this, is sort of, this almost feels like it's an echo of what we were talking about a little bit more earlier today about in terms of, you know, some things maybe you can stop once we start changing them. Antarctica, well, maybe you can find out how much we've changed it. Yeah, yeah. So I think that is all I've got. Oh yeah, our next, um, our, our, final, next guest. our final guest of the spring. Um, we are going to have the current Student Sustainability Center director, Sam Mokia. Um, and he is a transfer student. I'm pretty sure he's a third year studying yep. environmental and natural resource economics. Um, he is a super fun, super charismatic uh, person. We get to work with him um, through SOGES, and we're excited to hear what he has planned for the SSC and what's going on. Yeah, should be a fun conversation. Okay, everybody. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, and join us in two weeks to talk with Sam. Yep, that is going to be, um, I can tell you that right now, it is going to be May 7th, oh, the last wow, day of classes May. for CSU. So celebrate. Wow. Let's celebrate that. Okay. And now go have some fun. It's Friday. All right, everybody. Bye. It was a pleasure.